In April 1945, the strategic bombing war in Europe will be over. As it ends, the public on the Allied side finally see the true effect and horrified outrage grows. Allied military and political leaders scramble to reassure their citizens that terror is not their intent. But just as they do so, the next campaign over Japan of their doing begins in earnest, reaching new heights of destruction and death. The aerial war of World War II is far from over. This is episode 130 of War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. As set out in Schaaf's Directive No. 2 back in November, the targeting priorities for the combined bomber offensive remains oil targets and transport targets. Bombing these targets is perhaps contributing to crippling the operational capability of the German ground and air forces and depriving German industry of coal and raw materials. However, if we simply look at the timeline of events, it becomes hard to believe that it is anywhere close to the major factor. Up until January 1945, German war industry production output continues to rise. In mid-January, Reich Minister for Armaments Production, Albert Speer, boldly promises to double the output by the end of the first quarter. But then it suddenly flatlines in the first half of February and begins to plummet at the end of the month. What happened? Speer wasn't just voicing wild fantasies, his numbers were solid. The error was that they depended on access to one vital region with rich natural resources and by then home, or at least a source of raw material for a great part of German war industry, Upper Silesia. So when in February the Red Army invades and begins to take Upper Silesia, Speer's forecast falls apart like a house of cards. The motor that has been keeping the industry going is gone. Not destroyed by bombers, but cut off by the Allied land advances. The same has been happening gradually ever since the tides of war turned. The liberation of places like France, Belgium, Belarus, Ukraine, the Balkans and Poland cut off important access to resources and thwarted the German plundering of the industry in these regions. But what about that oil? Well, the same way that Upper Silesia has been the stopgap to keep the coal coming and the industry rolling, Romania was a main source of oil. Here it is the fall of the Romanian oil fields to the Red Army in August 1944 that turns the flow of fuel so badly needed by the German war machine into a drip feed. The RAF and USAAF do contribute during the rest of 1944 by disrupting transportation, destroying synthetic oil plants, and blowing away oil reserves. And although not the major factor, it is a contributing factor that stems from the November orders. Head of RAF Bomber Command, Arthur Harris, has reluctantly agreed to follow these orders, but he still devotes as much of Bomber Command's weight as he can to attacking German cities. Harris justifies these city attacks because of frequent poor weather preventing attacks on oil and transport targets and the inevitable presence of those targets in and around German cities. In February, new cities attacked by the RAF include Hanau on January 6th, which killed 90, Wiesbaden on February 2nd, 1,000 killed, and Worms February 21st with 239 killed. Chemnitz and Potsdam are also attacked, but reliable figures for deaths are hard to find. Observably, both suffer significant destruction to their built-up areas, though. Meanwhile, the USAAF 8th Army under Karl Spatz have also joined the attacks on German cities, mainly Berlin. On Saturday, February 3rd, 958 American aircraft, of which 939 come through the German defense lines, attack the Reich capital. It's the 288th air raid on Berlin, dropping more than 2,000 tons of explosives and 250 tons of incendiary bombs on the northwest part of Kreuzberg and the Mitte district, with the newspaper district and the export district around Ritterstrasse being severely hit. 
There's a strong wind blowing this day, and it fans the fires, furthering the devastation. The Wehrmacht reports 2,894 deaths, but the actual number is much greater, with British and American estimates as high as 25,000 mortal civilian casualties. The actual number is probably significantly lower than that, but it will never be firmly established. Nevertheless, it is the deadliest air raid on the Reich capital. Among the dead are People's Court Judge Roland Freisler, the man who presided over the kangaroo courts that condemned many of the suspects of the rising against Hitler in the July 20th bomb plot the year before. Among the 2,600 people he has condemned to death in his career, often while screaming Nazi propaganda and insults at the defendants, were also members of the White Rose resistance group, Hans and Sophie Scholl and Christoph Pabst. While Freisler's death at the business end of an Allied bomb may be hard to deplore, a large portion of the victims were also Allied POW and forced laborers, generally denied the use of air raid shelters by the Nazis. More than 20,000 people are injured, another 120,000 made homeless. 2,296 buildings totally destroyed, 909 severely, and 3,606 slightly damaged. The attack also has effect on the war effort, with 360 armaments companies eliminated and 170 impaired. It disrupts logistics by obliterating the tracks at the Potsdamer and Anhalter railway stations. Furthermore, it destroys several cultural sites like the Berlin Palace and the state opera Unter den Linden. Now, this mission is part of the remnants of a plan to completely destroy Berlin with such massive amounts of conventional bombs that they would have a similar effect as an atomic bomb. The idea is, again, that this will break the German spirit to resist in one fell swoop and force the immediate capitulation. The plan, devised in mid-1944 and codenamed Operation Thunderclap, was based on the idea of how the German bombing of Rotterdam in 1940 sped up Dutch capitulation and operationally modeled on the firebombing of Hamburg in 1943, which killed an estimated 37,000, mainly in the ensuing firestorm. With Thunderclap, a joint US AAF RAF task force proposed that 2,000 8th Air Force bombers would drop 5,000 tons of bombs on a two and a half square mile area of central Berlin in a daylight raid. The target area would have an estimated daytime population of 375,000. With a bomb density of close to 2,000 tons per square mile, they estimated 137,500 dead and 137,500 seriously injured. If the initial raid wouldn't do the trick, the 15th Air Force, who could add a raid by their forces and RAF Bomber Command, could also fly a follow-up nighttime incendiary raid if needed. The proposal gained support by British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and Supreme Allied Expeditionary Force Commander Dwight Eisenhower. But when it reaches head of the USAAF, Henry Hap Arnold, he objects strongly, citing the probability of adverse public reactions at home. He instead proposes a series of more limited raids, which is also what proceeds. But one man has not let go of the idea. Arthur Harris. It is a modified version of Operation Thunderclap that he launches in the night of February 13th when his forces attack Dresden. The background is that Dresden has long been on the list of permissible targets based on its status as a major rail hub. Destroying this and similar rail hubs in the East is considered necessary for several interlinked reasons. One, impeding the movement of German reinforcements to the Eastern Front, where the Western Allies erroneously believe that German resistance is stiffer than it is and Soviet capabilities lesser than they are. Two, imposing a greater strain on the wider German administrative and communications network by disrupting the major flows of refugees passing through the city by road and rail from East Prussia. Three, preventing German forces from moving south to the supposed Nazi last stand in the Alpine Redoubt. Perhaps more ink has been spilled over this than any air attack in the European bombing war, and we have covered the details in our day-by-day -day article for that date. But in summary, the firestorm kills 25,000 people and the images of the destruction of Dresden are horrendous. A city flattened and burnt, 
shrunken corpses hidden amongst the rubble, men and women lying dead in the streets, suffocated by the fires, a pyre of corpses awaiting cremation on the Altmacht Square. And now, Hap Arnold's prediction comes true, when Dresden provokes an immediate negative backlash. A senior RAF officer offhandedly mentions to a group of journalists that the raid has helped to destroy German morale. Howard Cohen, with the Associated Press, then files a report claiming that the Allies have resorted to naked terror bombing. This flies through the Allied press, particularly in America, and Hap Arnold is forced to reassure the public that the Americans are not complicit in terror bombing. The debate is further inflamed when Reichspropagandaminister Josef Goebbels informs neutral press services that the death toll in Dresden is 250,000, which it is not. The public backlash eventually forces Churchill to send a note to Harris' boss, Air Chief Marshal Charles Portal, on March 28th, urging against what he calls mere acts of terror and wanton destruction. But until then, area bombing continues. Shortly after Dresden comes an attack on Pforzheim. Relatively forgotten in the historical record, this proves to be even deadlier in proportional terms. The RAF attacks on the evening of February 23rd, shortly before 8 p.m., with a force of 367 Lancasters. The Pathfinder Mosquitoes do their job well, marking the city for the Lancasters. With little to no Luftwaffe interception, the Lancasters are able to drop down to just 8,000 feet, further improving accuracy. In just over 20 minutes, they drop over 1,800 tons of bombs, which fall mainly on the center of the old city with its maze of narrow streets and alleys. Such a cityscape is a prime location for a firestorm, and the individual blazes quickly merge into a hurricane of fire which burns at up to 1,600 degrees and covers an area of about 1.5 square miles. Smoke rises to 12,000 feet in the air. Families sheltering in the cellars of their apartment buildings burn to death or suffocate as the flames consume the oxygen. Others are crushed when gutted homes collapse on top of their cellars. Art student Gisela Bea has a narrow escape from this fate. The beams gave way like matches. I saw fire flowing into our cellar and father uncannily illuminated by the glow of fire standing against the wall with arms outstretched as if he was crucified. Our house had been blasted away. In front of us, the street above us, the sky around us, fire. Delayed action bombs went off everywhere. We had to get out. The three of us made it to the nearby railway. The only thing that saved us was our house being blasted away. Nobody survived the inferno in the houses next door. Those who are caught in the open die in the waves of fire which roar through the streets. Many of the exhausted and wounded people who find some brief refuge in the waters of the river Ents end up passing out and drowning. In a grim irony, some of those who escape the inferno later succumb to hypothermia on what is otherwise a cold February night. In all, more than 17,000 people are killed, about 30% of the city's population. It's the third deadliest Allied bombing of Germany after Dresden and Hamburg. A post-war survey by the British Bombing Survey Unit will estimate that 83% of the city's built-up area has been destroyed, probably the greatest proportion of any single raid during the war. The RAF chalked the raid up as a success. This was an outstanding attack with destruction on a scale as complete as any target ever attacked. There was hardly a single building left intact throughout the whole area, and apart from the tremendous gutting by fires, many acres of buildings were leveled to the ground. Damage to railway facilities was also heavy. The goods yard was completely burnt out, rolling stock destroyed. Two of the river bridges had collapsed, and the road over rail bridge spanning the marshalling yard was hit and rendered unserviceable. And despite Hap Arnold's reassurances, the USAAF also continue bombing Berlin. On March 18, Spots sends in over 1,300 bombers and 700 fighters to raid Berlin in the largest air raid on the German capital when measured in tonnage of bombs. 3,000 tons of bombs killed more than 3,000 people. As an impotent Luftwaffe fails to protect the nation's capital, as the Western Allies close in from east and west, and as Hitler's wonder weapons fail to turn the tide, morale reaches its lowest ebb. A report from the Sicherheitsdienst reads, 
Nobody believes that we can still escape a catastrophe with the methods and possibilities of waging war that have existed up until now. The last spark of hope remains rescue from outside, or a completely exceptional set of circumstances, or a secret weapon of enormous power. This hope, too, is being extinguished. So, now, in the closing weeks of the war in Europe, the Allies may finally have achieved their objective of breaking German civilian morale. But only in concert with a ground campaign which is already breaking down the doors of the Reich and a Nazi government that has given up any pretense of caring for their own people's well-being. Both USAAF and RAF will continue pummeling Berlin in the coming weeks until their final major raid on Hitler's birthday on April 20th. But while Hap Arnold publicly distances America from terror bombing in Europe, his forces in Asia are embarking on an equally ambitious aerial terror bombing campaign that will kill hundreds of thousands of Japanese civilians. When we left the story back at the end of January, Curtis LeMay had just taken over the B-29s of 21st Bomber Command charged with bombing Japan. The idea of precision bombing has now been almost completely abandoned in favor of hitting cities broadly with incendiaries. Ostensibly, this is to destroy the network of small subcontractors and workshops distributed throughout the city, which supply components to Japan's war industry. LeMay launches what we might call a test raid on February 25th, which burns out about a square mile of Tokyo. Buoyed by this success and frustrated by an ineffective precision bombing raid on March 4th, LeMay orders his crews to prepare for a mission unlike anything they've ever done before. On March 9th, he orders Operation Meeting House. This is to be a maximum effort with over 300 B-29s. It will be a nightly raid with a far heavier bomb load than usual. LeMay believes that Japanese night fighter defenses are so poor as to be non-existent. That evening, the bombers take off from their bases at Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. Shortly after 1 a.m. local time, the Pathfinder B-29s arrive over Tokyo guided by their bombing radars. The target is the Asakusa district, one of the most densely packed areas of Tokyo. The people below are completely unprepared for what is to come. As I've said before, the city has few proper air raid shelters. But that doesn't really matter because most people tonight have ignored the air raid warnings anyway. Instead, they remain inside their wooden homes, which are bone dry and ripe for a firestorm thanks to unseasonably low rainfall. The Pathfinders mark the area for destruction by carving a giant flaming cross with their M47 incendiaries. The follow-on waves have no trouble finding the blazing target. For over an hour, they drop their loads into the growing conflagration. In total, almost 1,700 tons of napalm-filled incendiaries fall that night. The firestorm burns at over 1,800 degrees. Just as in Pfotsheim, it sucks the oxygen from the air, roasts people to death, and burns human bodies to charcoal. The windows of homes melt, hurling drops of molten glass into the air. As people flee in panic, these falling drops of molten rain melt their skin and scalp. Just like in Germany, the people of Tokyo head for water, and the next morning, rescuers find a mass of bodies boiled alive in the pool of Futaba School. Within the target area, the destruction is absolute. A B-29 bombardier recalls his experience. When the bomb bay doors opened, the plane filled with smoke from the ground, and we smelled this horrible odor. We closed the bomb bay doors after we dropped and headed to sea. The odor was still so strong in the plane that the pilot ordered me to open the doors again to let the fresh air in. You could only imagine what was going on down below. That smell is, of course, the stench of burning homes and human flesh, hair, clothes, and organs. Carried up into the air in fatty smoke particles, it sticks in the flight suits of air crews for days afterwards. On the ground, Tokyo burns for days after the raid. Charred corpses lie in the streets, and the remains of homes and floating down the river. Sixteen square miles of Tokyo is destroyed. Over 110,000 people are killed, and one million left homeless. 
LeMay and Arnold consider meeting Alza to have been a roaring success. According to post-raid analysis, the destruction of the subcontractors cuts Tokyo's ability to produce war material in half. It lays the template for further firebombing of Japanese cities. Over the next 10 days, the B-29s will hit Nagoya on March 11th, Osaka on March 13th, Kobe on March 16th, and Nagoya again on March 19th. Casualties will be lower, about 10,000 in each raid, thanks to better Japanese preparedness. The firebombing will pause temporarily until mid-April as the bombers have burned through their reserves. I will return with how the bombing campaign over Japan develops. But this episode concludes my coverage of the strategic bombing war in Europe. Once the dust settles, 2,770,538 tons of Allied bombs will have devastated Europe's cities. Over 10 million people have been made homeless, and the cultural heritage of the continent damaged forever. Across the Reich, over 350,000 German civilians, Allied POW and foreign force laborers will have lost their lives. In France, 67,000 will have died. In the Benelux countries, over 10,000. Italy, some 60,000. Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria and Yugoslavia, around 75,000. In all, at least 600,000 men, women, children and infants are dead. More than a third of the people killed were civilians from nations fighting on the Allied side. The death toll of the air crews is no less staggering, with 170,000 air crews killed in action on the Allied side and close to 100,000 on the Axis side. They have scarred British cities and contributed to the total destruction of Warsaw and near destruction of Rotterdam, Leningrad, Kiev and other Soviet cities. In Britain, 60,000 civilians, in Poland, 50,000, in the Soviet Union, over 60,000, and in the Benelux, several thousand civilians will have been killed. The military effect is debatable. According to some analysis, it benefited the Allied war effort somewhat, but no one has been able to show a decisive advantage. On all sides, being bombed or seeing your fellow countrymen bombed hardened the will to resist the enemy, arguably prolonging, not shortening, the war. Neither the Axis nor the Allied campaign came anywhere close to achieving their goals of breaking or at least hobbling the enemy for a swift victory. From a military standpoint, it has been a wasteful effort of material and human life, ignoring the constantly mounting observable failures and the repeated warnings by many officers, politicians and expert observers making the air crews as much the victims of this campaign as the civilians. In moral terms, it has been a low point of political expediency, policy by vengefulness and wishful thinking over respect for the laws of war, humanity and common decency. The debate and the comments under each coverage I have made has been lively, occasionally ferocious. The public debate about the bombing of Germany between 1940 and 45 has at times taken on the form of Nazi apologist attacks on the Allies with false equivalences between the Allied aerial war and the Nazi Holocaust. On the other end, any critical analysis of the observable horror and failure of these campaigns has been shouted down as anti-patriotic or disrespectful of the fighting men's sacrifice. There is no equivalence to the Nazi genocide, not only because of the staggering difference in magnitude, but also because of the difference in intent. Critically analyzing the obvious failure of this campaign is a patriotic duty and respectful of the sacrifice forced upon the men who had to carry it out. To use these events to somehow justify even more atrocious events is an insult both to the involved and humanity as a whole. If we do not learn from the sacrifice and death, both in the air and on the ground, all these human beings will have died for nothing. The ultimate respect we can pay them is not just to remember and blindly celebrate them, but to hold them high and let them teach us that war is not only hell, but also a wasteful horror that when forced upon us requires us to rise above our basest instincts. For as the often misquoted lines by Nietzsche warn us, he who fights with monsters might take care lest he thereby becomes a monster. And if you gaze for a long time into an abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. Never forget. 